Hey folks, Ty here, Bench Clear Media. I know you're getting ready to watch a great episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard. What I want to make sure you know that starting tomorrow, Hobby Palooza 2021 kicks off. If you weren't uh, a participant or you didn't check out Hobby Palooza last year, we had 30 plus hours of content that was the responsibility of basically the entire community that came together on YouTube and individuals put out different videos and content throughout the weekend. We're doing the same thing this year starting tomorrow. And go to the hobbypalooza.com and you'll see the full schedule. Everything's uh, updated as we get it. So you'll see links to their videos, uh, what they're talking about, their subject, who their guests are going to be. And we're giving thousands of dollars of giveaways away, courtesy of Tops, Star Stock, Card Hedge, and Upper Deck. So be sure to go subscribe right below to Bench Clear Media. Um, go to the hobbypalooza.com and sign up for updates and to put your email address in there for drawings and enjoy one heck of a great weekend of content. All right. Enjoy the episode, Golden Age of Cardboard with uh, Mike Moynihan. Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the golden age of baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo, and hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. I'm your host, Mike Moynihan, and man, I'm glad to be here because anytime, anytime I get to talk at all about the national it's a good day. And it's one of my favorite events, one of my favorite things. And I get to combine it with my other love or another love, and that's vintage cards. And, you know, people think that buying a card is or can be a relatively simple thing. But when you get into vintage, there is some nuance and some particulars that people need to pay very close attention to so that you can kind of have the best outcome possible. And I know that one of my big things is having other people give me their opinion and help me out. And one of the guys that I trust implicitly with this, especially in the vintage world, is my guest tonight. And I, I've coined the phrase for him. I call him the cardboard whisperer. And the reason I call him that is because Andrew has a unique way of looking at a card and helping you think through the purchase of any big card just as he would do it. And the way he does it is incredibly smart, incredibly thorough. He doesn't just jump into things. He doesn't just buy stuff. He thinks about it. So I'm going to bring him on right now and we'll give him a talk and kind of see, pick his brain a little bit to help you guys how to have the best experience picking up vintage if that's what you want to do for the national. Andrew, what's up? How's it going, Mike? I'm good. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, uh, you notice you can't see Andrew, and there's a reason for that. We don't explain to everybody why you're not on camera. Uh, you know, I, all I can say is that I promise you, you are not missing anything. <laughs> you, you want to see what I look like? You can uh, see me at the national. There you um, go. But, uh, Happy to be here. I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm following Dr. James Beckett, so no pressure at all. No pressure at all. He doesn't know anything about vintage. I mean, good right. grief. Uh, no, you really are the cardboard whisperer, and, I, and I've given you that moniker with all due respect and certainly uh, well-intentioned and deserved, for sure. Man, tell me about your history and, and why you love vintage so much. And I, I want to give people a feel for who they're dealing with when they get to hear you talk about this because your collection's insane. And just tell everybody some of that history, Andrew. Well, um, 
I collected, I started collecting in the mid eighties, like 83, 84, really got into it around 85. Um, you know, buy and packs just like everybody else. And, um, my mother would take me and my brother to a, a, a card store in Arlington, Massachusetts called Hall's Nostalgia, which was a great store. It was actually one of the, um, first brick and mortar card stores in the country. And they had all kinds of incredible vintage and pre-war stuff that, you know, I couldn't afford back then, but I would just go look at it. And it was just kind of in awe of this stuff, Babe Ruth cards and, and the all time greats. And that was kind of the start of it. And then, um, as I've told many times on my channel and showed this card many times, my father bought a, um, T206 Ty Cobb green portrait for $20 at a show. Um, I remember it vividly the day he bought it. And, um, along with a T205 Christy Matthewson and he framed them and had them hanging in his house. And, um, I always loved those cards and I would look at them and on my 30th birthday, he gave them to me. Um, mm. and, uh, ended up a few years ago, taking them out of the frame and getting them graded. And, um, so those were my first uh, uh, pre-war cards, but just kind of have always had a fascination with the old kind of rare, obscure stuff and the history of the game. And, you know, that's kind of uh, the focus of my collection. I, I do collect um, more modern stuff as well. I open a lot of packs with my kids and I buy 50s and 60s and 70s stuff also, but really have, um, you know, the pre-war stuff, really pre-1920 mostly. Um as kind of the center point of my collection. Well, your collection is one of the best that I know of. And, and certainly pre-war it's unbelievable. I love how unique the items that you pick up are. They're special and you're, you're a huge Red Sox guy. Let's just get out, get that out on the table right now. <laughs> They're looking pretty good, aren't they? Uh, yeah. Devers is having a great season, Yeah, he is. but you know, I'm going to, Try not to throw up talking about the Red Sox, but <laughs> no, uh, they have a great history, obviously. And the fact that you love the Red Sox and you love pre-war and they're so, they were so good back then. Right. And you're able just to pick up so many, you got Tris Speaker and Ruth and uh, Bobby Dorr and Ted Williams, just so many great guys from those eras that were literally all time greats. I, I think Tris Speaker is one of the most underappreciated players of all time quite frankly yeah. uh but really incredible stats you know the red sox had a, a gap of about eight decades where they weren't uh, obviously couldn't win a world <laughs> series but uh the early history they they were uh, one of the best teams and won won a bunch of world series um they did including well, the go ahead so yeah i mean it's definitely uh fun for me to collect the early red sox stuff i'm always on the lookout for that kind of stuff and you get team cards and uh, postcards, or just all sorts of cool stuff, man. And I love it seeing your mail days, seeing what you're picking up and why you picked it up, and and teaching me about that. That's where the cardboard whisperer comes from. And your your eye is very very unique, and that's a compliment. Like you are incredibly <laughs> diverse in what you know about and your knowledge, and it's fantastic. Which is why I wanted to have you on the show because anybody that's going to the national and buying vintage, not the camera just did that, uh, very different than buying modern cards or ultra modern cards. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Uh, in some ways, I agree with it. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we've talked about, you know, Andrew, are, are really relevant to, to any card. Um, Hold on. I think, no, we're but, still going. My internet's just sucks. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, no, I think that there are some things that are um, particularly relevant. I can, with I can hear you. Cards and, okay. Um, am I coming through across, coming across okay? Can you hear me? I can. All right. We, we broke up there for a second. Um, but uh, 
what I was saying is, yeah, I think there are some things that are particularly relevant um, for pre-war and vintage cards as opposed to modern cards. Uh, you know, in in some regards, the the grading scale, especially on the lower end of the scale, it, it, there's a lot more difference between the, um, you know, for instance, I pulled out these two cards. Glare's terrible there, but this is a one. I don't know if you can see that. For those listening, he's showing a T two hundred six. Sorry, this is a uh, this is an E ninety five Bill Carey. E ninety five. Okay. It's created a SGC one, and this is just a uh, horrible looking card. It's creased, it's stained, it's not registered well. And that's a one, and this is also a one, which is a T two hundred six Ty Cobb red portrait. Uh, and the technical grade is a one and it looks much better than the E95, which is also a one. And I think, um, you know, with modern cards, most nines are gonna look pretty much the same. Most tens are gonna look pretty much the same. There might be minuscule differences, but they're gonna look, you know, largely the same. On the lower end of the grading scale, I think that there's a lot more different, a big, a bigger uh, differential between what the cards can look like at those lower grades. And um, that's something that I really look for, lower grade cards with good eye appeal. Define good eye appeal to you. Uh, I mean, it, it really is something that um, for me is a card that has good registration. A lot of early pre-war cards are blurry because of the way that they printed them. Um, I look for ones that are uh, not blurry, that have, you know, the, the image looks good, um, preferably well-centered. The corners don't mean that much to me. Minor creasing doesn't mean that much to me as long as it's not across, you know, the face, uh, preferably. Um, that's what I look for. But, you know, some people, uh, you know, sharp corners is, is what's important to them. And so there's all kinds of different uh, things that people look for, but that's what I look for. Yeah. And it can be in the eye of the beholder, right? I mean, if you like the card, then okay. You know, Absolutely. that doesn't mean I have to or vice versa. And, but I think generally most collectors, especially a vintage, accept a couple of things. Number one, you accept that there's going to be some wear and tear on the card because it's so freaking old, right? I mean, that's just, you want an old baseball card to look old uh that to me there's something to that and then the other thing is you know if you want it to look old it's not going to be perfect and you want it to be pretty well i think most people care about centering a lot because yeah, a miscut card's just distracting right uh you know I, I there's a tolerance level for me and you know certain cards especially really rare cards i'll you know i'll take what i can get um but you know i, I definitely prefer a, a well-centered card yeah yeah um i pulled out another one this is uh this is something i actually bought at the national in atlantic city i think it was 2016. um this is a ted williams rookie 1939 play ball and this is a two um probably i don't know how well you'll be able to see it but it presents really well to me for a two and it has you know some really minor scuffing on the back there that you probably can't even see but this is kind of the kind of card that i look for and i paid like i think 700 bucks for this um which i was thrilled with at the time and you know so that's the kind of thing that i look for yeah and at the national and and really as you said this these kind of thoughts and and you know, things to think about apply really to any show probably, right? Not just the national, but I think what differentiates the national and maybe you can speak to this is how many more copies you might be able to find of a certain card than maybe at a regional show. If you're at a regional show, you might be able, there might be only one Ted Williams rookie card in the whole place, right? Yeah. Versus at the national, you might have 10 or 20 of them potentially to look at and choose from. Do you agree that that's true? Yeah. I mean, the national, if, you know, for those of you that haven't been there, it's, it's just on a different level. I mean, it's there, there's stuff that, that you'll see there that you don't see or are very unlikely to see at, at, at a smaller show. Um, you know, if you're looking for, uh, you know, a, um, 
Hank Aaron rookie, which you picked up a beautiful uh, Hank Aaron rookie a couple of years ago. There's hundreds of Hank Aaron rookies in, in the room and, and you can, um, you know, look for the one that's going to be perfect for you. And then you kind of have to be ready to, to uh, snatch it up when you find it, because if it's, if it's a nice example, it's not going to be there for long. Um, but you know, there's going to be a selection uh, uh, available to you. Um, you know, for, for more rare stuff, even at the national, there, there might be only one or two of something in the room or, or, or no examples at all. Um, here's another card I pulled out. The uh, National in Chicago two years ago, I uh, went there with, with my main objective to was to locate this card. And I searched the entire room for about a day and a half before I bought anything and uh, discovered that there were no examples of this card in the room. Um, one guy had told me that he had one at home, but it had writing on the front and uh, ultimately was able to get this one. But, you know, I spent a day and a half looking <laughs> for a card that wasn't there. So even at the national, there's going to be stuff that, that you can't find, but um, you know, compared to the average local or even regional show, there's just so much stuff there. It's, it's overwhelming. There's a word that I think describes you very well. And I want you to talk about, if you don't mind why you're this way. And the word I'm talking about is patience. And you are an incredibly patient buyer. What do you think has led to that? created that in you you just mentioned you walked around for a day and a half looking for one card and i know you've done that before in other shows where you're literally just looking for kind of a needle in the haystack or maybe you just don't see the right one and you're incredible you don't just settle for a lesser card what has created that in you do you think I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, in the past have uh, on occasion as with that Oxford Ruth, I just become obsessed with a card and um, you know, that card there's last time I checked maybe between 20 and 30 total graded examples. So not easy to find. And I just become hyper-focused on getting a particular card. And um, you know, in, until I satisfied myself, you know, with, with determining that that card wasn't in the room, I wasn't really going to pull the trigger on anything else. Um, ultimately, I found something else uh, that I'm very happy with, um, which is what I left with, which is this uh, Joe Jackson, um, famous in bar. But um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I just uh, there's certain cards that I've kind of become uh, you know really um, infatuated with, and and have just searched for these cards until I find them and. Um, you know, it can be a frustrating way to collect, um, this year so far, you know, we're halfway through the year. I I've, with the exception of some bargain bin stuff that I've gotten at some shows and, and some stuff for my kids, I've bought like before the Philly show that happened a couple of weeks ago, I bought three cards for the entire year. Um, you know, so it, it, it can be a frustrating way to collect, but, um, you know, we all have budgets and and i want to try to make sure that my money goes for what it is that i really want no i love that that's something i think people need to hear more of that you're not just buying everything out there you have a you know a set of this is what i'm looking for you know a set of things that you're looking for in cards different cards that you're looking for i i absolutely respect that the heck out of that that you're that disciplined and going no i this is what i'm really wanting and like you said, we all have have budgets and you're so hyper focused in it. And I mean that in a good way, complimentary. Way. And you 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 don't settle. And But I think too many collectors out there do. I think they well, I want to use Hank Aaron rookie earlier. Uh, I think guys just well, I'll just buy one when I see a, a good price or, you know, they don't put a ton of thought into it. And we, you need to do that on the vintage side. You really, really do the whole, it's a marathon, not a sprint is so, so true about vintage. Don't you think? Yeah. I, you know, I, I've found just personally that when I've kind of bought something and felt that I was settling for it, um, I end up not happy with it. And, and on occasion have ended up selling or trading the card away and kind of, 
waiting, you know, until I can get the one that I really want. And, you know, over time and having gone through that, it's easier just to wait for the one you want. Um, you know, and there's certain cards, you know, that are ultra rare or scarce that, um, like I pulled these ones out. I, these are two of the cards that I bought this year. Um, this is a, uh, I'm sorry, a Diaz cigarettes, Walter Johnson card. And, you know, how well you can see it. it has some holes in it it's not a great uh you know looking card with the damage but there's three including this one great examples of this in the world so and i got to, i bought this one raw but um you know if this is what you're looking for and you see one you better snatch it up because you're not going to see another one and um i actually pulled these out because i'm going to get these re-slabbed at the uh at the national slabbed by sgc no, by PSA. They, uh, um, I think they turned out beautifully. I like the way they look in the slab, but they don't have the internal sleeve. Uh, uh, and they're really thin um, cardstock, and they kind of move around in the slab. So I, I had emailed PSA, and they agreed to do it at the National. I don't want to send them back in and have them bouncing around in the slab. So they're going to re-slab them, um, complimentary re-slabbing at, uh, at the show. So you brought up something that I think maybe people can distinguish in these two different trains of thought as you're hunting for cards at the national or again, any big show, there's the ultra super rare kind of stuff that if you see it, you better buy it because you probably won't see it again. And then there's the, there's plenty of these cards out there. Let's take an example of a card that I'm looking to buy at the national in 1953 Bowman Mickey Mantle, right? There's tons of those out there. So there will probably literally be a hundred plus to choose from at the national. Do you, th I think there's two different mindsets, right? You got the, again, that ultra rare thing, buy it when you see it versus, and I, and I think maybe where we can maybe direct the conversation is more of the, there's going to be plenty of those. I say plenty. It's not like there's going to be like, there's going to be Luka Doncic rookies or, you know, Jason Tatum rookies, but, uh, there will be plenty to choose from, several to choose mm -hmm. from. Uh, with that being said, one of the things I think is we we touched on patience. And even on that stuff, the stuff that's quote unquote more plentiful, you still need to be patient. You don't just need to buy the first one you see. Uh, but I also think one thing that's really important is trying to have smarter people around you <laughs> and I, I've tried to take that to heart a lot. You know, when I bought my Hank Aaron rookie, I was with those back pages. We looked at a hundred before I picked the one that I wanted to buy. So there's that. I was actually hunting for that card. Another story is, that involves you is my 1951 Bowman Willie Mays rookie mm -hmm. that I don't know. I don't think we were walking around together at the time. This was in, 2018 or no 19 in Chicago mm -hmm. and walking around and I found this card and I, I either texted you or called you. I said, I need you to get over here <laughs> because yeah. I'm thinking about buying this card and I need some help. And it wasn't so much. How do I describe it? I wanted you to genuinely talk me out of it. If I, if you thought it was a, not a great deal. And I wanted you to talk me into it. If, if you thought it was, does that make sense? Yeah. And that I, you know, I do the same thing. Um, it sometimes being patient is a good thing, but also when you aren't ready to, to, you know, take the plunge and buy the card at the right time, sometimes you can miss out. And I've definitely had many occasions where I've gone back to get something once I've worked through it in my mind and decided I want it and it's gone. Um, and that's incredibly frustrating also. So I do the same things, so, you know, whether it's calling someone to come look at something, whether to talk me into it or talk me out of it. Um, sometimes, oftentimes it, it's beneficial to have someone else, you know, to, to, to bounce the ideas off of and, and take a look at a card. So that's something that I definitely do also, especially with a bigger purchase. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the realization is that 
in that moment that I wanted to buy that card, I was emotionally invested in that decision process. And when you let your emotions drive your decisions, it doesn't always turn out to be, sometimes you're right. Sometimes that's a good thing. But I have learned that I need to remove as much emotion from that decision as possible. Is this a good buy or not? And you were incredibly helpful in looking at the card and really grinding on the card. And that word, I mean, like you were looking at it much more, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, I was looking at it from an emotional standpoint. You were looking at it very practically. That's not the right word, but I can't come up with it right now. My vocabulary is, you know, failing me at this moment. But you were looking at the card very differently than I was looking at the card. I think sometimes it's easier to look at something a little more critically and 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 there you go. Point things critically. out. Um, yes. When you're not the one, you know, who's going to be dropping the money on it, or you know, it, it and it, I I fall in the same trap of getting you know so emotionally attached to something before I even possess it that I'm, you know, willing to throw money at a dealer, um, you know, and, and sometimes you got to take a step back and, and, and have someone either talk you down or, or, or push you, you know, into, uh, you know, picking up the card when the time is right. You know what the funniest part about that story was? And I ended up buying the, the maze. You asked me at the end of the day, you simply said, Mike, do you like the card? I remember that as clear as day. Like, do you like it? And I said, yes, I love it. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and then you said, then you should buy it. You know, that was kind of the, the where we got after all the anal analyzing the card and being, you know, looking at it critically, as you said. And it ultimately came down, do you like it? We both thought it was a good deal price wise. Like it was fair. It was more like, and, and that's, I think we're going to talk about pricing next, actually, because. I think it's important to talk through this, but it was a fair price and all that. And so I, by the way, I appreciate that. And the many other cards I've sent you and texted you pictures of and whatnot over yeah. the years where you've helped me. Well, I mean, we've, we've definitely bounced a lot of ideas off each other over the years with, with various cards. And um, I remember, you know, that moment speaking with you and looking at that card. And, and I think that, that we, we did determine that the price was fair. You, you didn't steal it at the time certainly worth a whole lot more now um it was a fair price at the time and um it was you know it's a nice looking card and, and you you definitely made the right choice i think you were with me several big purchases i were you with me when i bought my ernie banks rookie the year before i think you were because I, I was i was uh, using i think i think i did go over there and look at it yeah Cause you were, I was using your VCP at the time because <laughs> I was, now I have it. So you don't have to worry about it as much this year, but I, I didn't have it then. And you were helping me out trying to figure out pricing. So let's, let's talk about pricing and show pricing and, and eBay pricing are very different. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, generally. General, especially on vintage, right? Cause as we've already described, not all, examples of certain numerical grades are the same for right? sure and and so i appeal matters i appeal changes the price it can be dramatically on vintage cards way more than it is on modern cards or ultra modern cards for sure and so taking all that into account knowing what comps are and knowing to negotiate and all of that stuff is important but i think you need each person that buys a card you need to have a number of what you're willing to pay and be ready to try to negotiate to get that price. Um, what's been your experience with pricing at shows and working with dealers and stuff like that? That's a broad question, but go with it, run with it. You know, when, you know, if you're buying a um, 2011 trout update, there's a ton of data out there on what the card should be going for. And, you know, some dealers are always going to be unreasonable with, with what they want. Some are going to be more, um, you know, willing to, to listen to, to comps, et cetera, but you have a pretty good idea on what that card should cost. Right. Right. Um, in a PSA 10 or a nine or whatever. Um, when it comes to vintage and pre-war like you said and like i pointed out with the cards i showed at the at, uh, you know a few minutes ago 
the eye appeal really can change that. And then beyond that, you also have in, in a lot of instances, cards where there's not a lot of recent data, sales data to show what the card should be going for. Um, you know, if you're buying something that a very low pop card or, or um, you know, something that just doesn't come up for sale a lot, it, it's a lot more difficult to price something like that. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I have some cards in my collection where I try to get some data that, cause I already own them and you know, it hadn't sold since say last October, <laughs> you know, there hasn't been a sale on eBay. There's probably been private sales and sales of shows of this, of a, of certain cards. But the reality is, like you said there, if there's not a lot of data, how do you, how do you figure out a price? Yeah. I mean, um, just to touch on VCP for a second, I don't know if you are aware of this. Uh, VCP is going to be dropping a new app prior to um, the national. This should be available from what I heard today. Um, so just a uh, non sequitur yeah, there, but but that, that could be pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's <laughs> coming up with a price. Sometimes you can look for something similar, something for, you know, from the set of a different, you know, a different player from the same set that maybe of the same caliber, different ways you can try to come up with a, a number for things. But a lot of times, you know, this pull this card out of my, uh, to show this one. Uh, I bought this raw at a show years ago. I actually went back and forth with the dealer on the price, um, for a while. This is a 1908 Cy Young postcard. And, uh, you don't see a lot of, there you go. We'll see a lot of these come up and we, this is a dealer that I'm friendly with and we just were a little bit off on the price. And you know, how do you price something like this? I ended up going home. We just couldn't, couldn't get together on the price. And I, I drove all the way home, about you know, half hour from the show and got home and realized, man, I'm an idiot. You know, I, I'm not going to see this again. You know, the price wasn't unreasonable for what it is. And I drove back and bought it. Um, you know, but it's it, it can be challenging to, uh, especially with a dealer that you're not familiar with who has you know a crazy price on something and um, trying to negotiate when you don't have a lot of data to to support what you are saying as far as price. You know, you mentioned working with certain dealers. You you've been, we've both been in this hobby a long time. I'm sure for you, especially regionally at shows, there's guys you see constantly as you're going to shows over yeah. the years, maybe not in the last year, but over, over time you've done deals with certain dealers. I have found that talking to a dealer, not just thinking about the money part, but talking about the human side of it, maybe it's, you know, this is the last card, like not that you lie to someone, but if a card has special meaning to you, I think conveying that, to the dealer will get you a better deal. Uh, again, don't lie, but like, if, man, this is the last card I need for this player run or this set, or I've never seen this before. And I'm a huge Red Sox collector, like, you know, something for you to use just not again, trying to be deceptive, but being genuine and authentic about why that card needs to be in your collection and not in his dealer case anymore. I think can grease the wheels for an easier negotiation or at least not being stuck at a certain price. Yeah. Especially when you have a relationship with a particular dealer. Um, I, I think when the dealer knows that this is something that's going to be going into your collection, as opposed to something that you're going to try to flip or, or sell two days later, um, you know, maybe psychologically for them, it's easier to, to let it go also. I don't know. Um, yeah, I've had dealers ask me specifically, like, you're not going to flip this art. Like if I, they give me a pretty good deal, I'm like, no, man, it's PC. You know, it's PC for me. And I hope they believe me because it's true, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but like, man, I'm not getting rid of this card. This is a casket card or whatever. This is a huge card for me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that can help. You got to wonder if they are, you know, Again, if you're authentic enough and genuine enough, I, I think they'll see through that you're not bullshitting them, you know? You know, there's and, dealers. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. 
there's dealers that, you know, from having been going to shows for a long time that um, I walk right past their table. You know, um, I, I just, people I just don't want to deal with people that for whatever reason, I, just, <laughs> um, you know, their prices are crazy or they're just an unpleasant person or whatever. Um, I'm not inclined to, to, uh, deal with that, that type of person. There's other dealers that, you know, I buy from repetitively and, you know, at, at the national, um, I've already scoped out the dealer list and there's, you know, coming up with my plan for when I walk in the door on Wednesday, there's tables, uh, you know, I have the map. I know where I'm going. There's a couple tables, a couple dealers. I want to go see their stuff first. And it's because I, I know what they have, what they're likely to have. And, and because, uh, you know, I, they're someone I can trust and have bought from maybe, you know, maybe in the past. And um, so I, when I'm planning my um, strategy for the national, that's something that I consider also, who do I want to go to first and, and, you know, where are they in the room? And um, you know, it's definitely something to think about. You know, it is, you mentioned having a plan for the national first question with that is how many nationals have you, this will be your what national, how many this nationals will be my fourth national. Okay. I've been going to, uh, you know, bigger regional shows for a long time, but up until, uh, you know, let's see, what was the first one really wasn't able to, you know, with younger, younger kids and, and stuff going on. And it wasn't until I think 2016 was my first national. Okay. And I, I hope to never miss another one. There you uh, go. Well, you mentioned having a plan. And I think you and I think differently about that. And and the, the point I'm going to make with, while talking through this is that there's not a wrong way to do it. I go into a show, as you've probably heard me say, kind of with open mind. I have some cards I might be kind of you know, if I see this, I'm really going to take a hard look at it because it's a key card that I'm wanting to add to my collection. But the reality is I've got so many things that I want to add to my collection that I try to be as open-minded going to a show and kind of whatever comes my way will come my way. The Maze Rookie, for example, wasn't even on my list of something to buy in 2019. Like I thought there's no way I'll be able to find this card at a price that I can afford. And so it, it never even entered my mind and I saw it and I was like, Oh, well, this is different. This might be something pretty special and call you and all the things transpire and I get the card. So I'm pretty open-minded about what could, what cards could talk to me in the moment and end up picking them up. Whereas you have this plan. So for the national this year, you said you're putting your plan together. Do you have, which cards are you kind of eyeballing, targeting, thinking about? Well, first off, I'll say that it's probably a lot more fun to go in with the attitude that you have and not be, um, you know, be more open minded and, and, and not be so hyper focused on finding one thing that that really can be frustrating and and, um, you know, difficult this year. Uh, there isn't like one particular card. I have a list of probably 50 cards um, and definitely some dealers that I want to check out, you know, Wednesday when the doors open. But as far as like looking for that one card, like when I was looking for the Oxford Ruth, I don't have that this year. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to go in with, you know, being a little more open-minded as far as, you know, see what I come across. And, um, you know, there's certain things that, that, that I'm always looking for and, and may never find. Um, but yeah, not, not one particular card this year. So just have what to see your... what, I, what I come across. What are your favorite things about the national? Why is it different? I mean, it's just, just the, the, the size and the, and the scope of all the, you know, the things that you see there, you know, I think a lot of dealers hold on to their best stuff all year. I, I know this for a fact, some dealers do this. They don't even go to some of the smaller shows. They accumulate stuff over the course of the year so they can put it out for sale at the national. And, you know, it's, it's special stuff, whether it's modern stuff or, uh, and, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not as much in tune with the modern um, market, but, you know, I, I'm sure it's the same with modern and, and you know, um, 50s cards. It's not any different. You're going to see special things. And, um, you know, it's just really fun for me to five days isn't even enough for me. I, I could really do a couple more days. I'm going to be there from the minute it opens on Wednesday till um, I have a, a, a 8 p.m. flight on Sunday and I plan on spending every minute there. 
Um, you know, it's, I, I just really love it. Is I, it I never feel the same way. Is it uh, tiring? It's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but in a good way. Um, I, I actually went out today. I had the day off today and <laughs> went to the Skechers store, bought some new shoes, some, uh, you know, comfortable shoes, as everyone says. But, man, it's this is the truth. <laughs> Those concrete floors will wear you out. But, um, you know, being able to catch up with people that you communicate with all year, maybe on YouTube or or by text message, but you only get to see them once a year. Man, it, it, it's fun to catch up with people and, and talk about cards and look at cards and walk around together looking at cards and, um, you know, at, at night talking about the stuff that you bought that day. It's just, I mean, I just love it. It's it's a stress reducer for me. It's just something that I really enjoy. So, you know, people that talk about it's not worth your time to go to the national. I, I almost feel sorry for people that say that, people that think that way. You know, if it's a business decision, then I guess I understand that. But um, it's a hobby for me. And, you know, I, I really look forward to it. And I, I just can't wait to get there. Yeah, me neither. Uh, by the time this airs, we'll be, you know, about three weeks away from the show and it can't get here fast enough. Uh, I thought you were going to say hanging out with me was your favorite part of the national, but that's, all uh, right. well, you know, it, it ranks in there somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere, probably way down there as it should uh, rightfully. So, uh, but you're right. I mean, I only, you and I talk, uh, probably not as much as we should, but, uh, I do consider you a friend. I enjoy getting, I mean, getting to see you is going to be certainly fun for me. Do you find it true that, because this is true for me. When I see somebody, one of my friends get a card that I know they've been hunting for, they, they got a great deal. I'm super, I, I'm, I'm almost as excited for them as they are. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, when I bought the maze, I think you were happy for me at the time. It's the, the whole atmosphere is, you know, seeing people find something that they're happy with, whether it's, whether it's finding a, 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 you know, something cool out of a dollar box. I mean, I, you know, which I also love doing, not, not, you know, the pre-war stuff isn't the only stuff I look for. Um, but you know, it, it definitely is, um, enjoyable to see true collectors find something that they're happy with, whatever it is. Um, and it's all at the national. I mean, that's. Yep. And we all know what each other is into from watching each other on YouTube or whatnot. And, like I know you're obviously a Red Sox guy and I know uh, your sons are into it and stuff. And, you know, buying a simple $10 Lee Smith eight by 10 signed in a Red Sox uniform and giving it to you for your kid. Yep. That, it's hanging on his wall, by the way. Which is awesome. I, but that's huge joy. For, I, I love doing that stuff. And people do that for each other all the time. It's not just a one-off event. You know, I see it happen over and over. People bring stuff to the national, just hoping to see that one guy that they pulled it out of their their collection to say, "Hey, I thought you would love this card. I want to give it to you." I've had that happen to me. People do that to me. People I've literally never met before. My Zach Wheat rookie, the T206, was given to me by Ryan. I never even met him before. He saw me on the floor. I brought this card just hoping I would see you so I could give it to you. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, that is so cool. And you don't get that just everywhere that only that stuff happens at the national all the time. Well, that, that was really cool. Um, you know, it, just to piggyback off that, I mean, it, it's um, having other people helping you look for things is incredibly important at a show like this, where you can't possibly see everything in there. No matter you could spend every waking moment at that show, walking around, just looking and you'll never see everything. So to have other eyes out there, you know, looking for stuff. If anyone, if anyone sees a uh, Diaz cigarettes, red roughing card, you know, get in touch with me. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of the bigger cards in my collection, I have been able to acquire because someone knew I was looking for them and reached out to me and told me about them. Totally happens all the time. Yeah. Right. And I think again, people that haven't been can't understand the vastness, the sea, of cardboard that's there and the P plus you're dealing with all the people. It's going to be worse this year than ever. Um, 
you know, maneuvering around and seeing everything is going to be dang near impossible. Yeah. You know, if it's um, having been to a couple bigger shows on the East coast in the last month or so, it's uh, it's going to be busy <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, but it'll be fun. It's, it, there's, there's a kind of a, um, the hobby is, is, is booming and, it, and it's a good thing. Um, and so, you know, the more people that are going to be there enjoying the show, I, I think, I think it's good. Yeah, it's good for the hobby overall. Would you say, I don't know if you saw my episode a couple episodes ago with George regarding my perception that the vintage card market is softening tremendously in terms of prices. Have you seen that on the stuff you're looking for? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've certainly, yeah, I mean, a lot of the prices, it, it, you know, whether pre-war, modern, vintage, whatever, are, are coming down. A lot of them were artificially inflated, I think, for a while. Um, you know, for the stuff that I'm looking at, even with a dip, the st it's still higher priced than what it was, you know, a year and a half ago. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, certain things definitely have come down in price. Certain things, you know, remain uh, historically high. And there's stuff that I have on my want list that I always kind of thought I'd be able to get that now are out of reach. You know, someday I'll be able to get whatever it is. And, and now, you know, uh, I, I don't see the prices going back down on certain things. So um, I think the ultra rare is kind of setting a new, you know, it'll stay high. The, the super rare stuff. Right. But how's Jack doing by the way, on his, uh, hall of fame rookie collection. Uh, he's doing good. He's, he's, you know, picking up stuff here and there. Jack's my older son. He, he's, uh, 14. Um, he, he started doing the PSA registry, as you know, um, post-war hall of fame rookies. And, uh, yeah, so I'll be on the lookout for, uh, Johnny bench for him and a couple other things. Nice. Um, I don't know, he's, he's giving me a list, I'm sure. But uh, well, tell him Mike Baseball Collector will be helping him out too, trying to find some good examples. You just give me a grade and a budget, and we'll make it all. You know, that's again, that's the old. I'm already looking at cards. <laughs> if I, you know, do you find? I want to ask you this because I was, I went yesterday to a show uh, with my son, and it was a Pokemon show, and they had a few sports. It was meant to be like a collector con thing. And there were only three or four tables that had sports cards. And I almost pulled the trigger on a 58 tops Clemente in a SGC four. And I didn't do it because it, and he had a price at 150 bucks. It was super reasonable. And I just, well, he had a price at 300. He was willing to do it. For 150, which that, that people say dealers aren't willing to do deals and come off. I don't believe that at all. But my point of telling you that in, in the story is as I was walking around, look at all these Pokemon, they all look the same to me. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine someone that's not into sports cards walking around a place like the National and it all looking the same. The irony of that is that for most of it, it is all the same. It's all, you know ultra modern basketball or football or, you know, baseball, you'll see 1,500, you know, Ronald Acuna bat down cards, you know, in a PSA 10, they're all over the place. What I have found is that I can, if I'm kind of thinking about a card and like, let's say it's the 53 Bowman color mantle, I can walk very quickly discern what I'm looking. I can go, yep, nope, yes, no. And you you train yourself, you train your brain, you train your eyes to pick out because you know what the most likely, you know what the card looks like, a color pattern, a, mm -hmm. a photograph, something that's going to catch your eye. And I think we can train ourselves to quickly hunt through and, and find those versus spending a lot of time, wasting time looking at stuff that you don't care about. Have you found that to be true about you? Yeah. I mean, I definitely, you know, <laughs> I try to walk by a table and, and, and scan it. Obviously you don't want to spend a half hour looking at stuff you have no interest in. I mean, you can kind of gauge whether or not it, the, the cases have anything that, that might be up your alley. Um, you know, but at, at other times I I've gone back later on and, and discovered that I overlooked something that was in the corner of a showcase that didn't really kind of match the rest of the stuff in there. So, yeah, I mean, you can, you can certainly, 
scan a case and, and see if it's likely to have what you're looking for. Um, yeah, yeah it, I, I definitely do that. It, it's definitely a skill to, to hunt for cards and, you know, experience matters, but to gain experience, you have to, you know, go <laughs> and kind of cut your teeth and learn and make mistakes. And all those things will happen to every collector at some point. You'll either have the, oh, I wish I would have bought this card back in the, you know, oh, I remember I could have gotten that, you know, the whole fish, big fish that got away kind of thing. We all have those stories and those stories teach us to not do that the next time. You, you learn yeah. from your mistakes and we're all going to make them. Any final thoughts, Andrew, before I let you go? I uh, really appreciate your time, by the way. Uh, yeah, ha happy to uh, to uh, be talking about it. One of my favorite <laughs> things to talk about. Um, <laughs> you know, I just a couple things that I do. I don't know, maybe it, if it could help someone. Probably, probably everyone does this. But as I'm walking around, I, I take pictures of things that I might be interested in. And you know, at night I go up to the hotel room or, or wherever and kind of look at it again and, and do, do my research on the cards and decide if it's something I want to go back and look at uh, again. Um, you know, it's, it's just a way for me to kind of gate, like see what's available and then make decisions. And, and when I can look back at the photos, I end up with, you know, a hundred photos of stuff that I saw during the course of the day. And um, hopefully I, <laughs> I had, you know, written down where it is that I saw it. Otherwise you'll never find it again. Um, that's something that I do. I, you know, the other thing that I plan on doing, um, and I have done at recent shows that I've gone to, which is something that I didn't do for a long time was bring stuff to trade. Um, I don't have a whole lot of like the majority of my stuff. Once it goes in my collection, it's, it's hopefully there to stay, but there's a handful of things that, that, um, I've identified in my collection that I'm willing to trade potentially. And it's a good way of, of, uh, being able to acquire stuff when, you know, when the cash runs out or, uh, you know, a bigger item that you otherwise couldn't, couldn't buy. So, um, I remember you did that. Sorry. I remember, is that the, there was a card you got uh, at the national, you traded a, a, uh, cracker jack to a speaker. I think I traded like a, a day um, after you bought it or something. It was a Does Cy that ring about? 206 Cy Young, um, which I actually sold okay. the day after I bought it and then went and bought a, uh, a um, 1921 Exhibits Babe Ruth card. Um, so that was very That's much right. out of character for me. I usually don't, don't do that. But trading is definitely a way uh, to, you know, be able to acquire things that you may, maybe not wouldn't be able to acquire otherwise. Um, so I, I plan on bringing, bringing some stuff, you know, I'm going to go through my stuff and see what I have. Um, but you know, just a thought. Okay. What else? A lot of dealers are willing to do that. So. Any other good thoughts? Good, good advice for people. Uh, you know, get to the show as early as you can. If you, you know, not everyone schedule allows it, but, but man, if you can be there Wednesday and, and, and figure out what dealers you want to go to, whether it's, particular dealer that has good uh, um, bargain bins or, or, you know, good fifties hall of fame rookies or good pre-war stuff, get there early, have a plan. You know, if, if there's certain dealers you want to hit up and, and uh, you know, just enjoy it. Try, try not to get too focused on one thing like I have in the past, I guess, it, you know, it can be good, but it can also kind of take the fun out of it a little bit. So if you're going to the national, have a good time, try not to get too stressed about cards and, just enjoy yourself and enjoy the uh, people that you're going to see there. Great advice. Well, if you see Andrew at the show, you won't know what he looks like, but I know what he looks like. So if you see me hanging around and you come up, I'll introduce you to Andrew and make you know, sure I you do have a uh, enough said cards t-shirt that uh, my brother got me that maybe I'll, maybe I'll have to crack that out for the national. We'll see, but uh, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. But if you, well, if you I, see anyone wearing a, enough said card shirt, that's probably me. <laughs> Well, I cannot wait to see you tell everybody where they can find you, uh, on YouTube. And I'm telling you guys, if you don't follow Andrew's channel, you are and you love vintage, you're missing out. You need to go check him out. Tell everybody where they can find you, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, my YouTube channel is Nuff said that's two words N U F C E D cards. And, um, 
uh, try to post as often as I can. Sometimes there's periods of time where I don't so much, but posted a video today. Um, and I'll definitely be doing a national recap, ho hopefully doing a, a video while I'm at the national. So that's awesome. I got something to look forward to go watching here after we're done with the, this show. The I recap videos are, are, are so much fun to watch. No, but I want to watch your video from today. You said you posted a video. Oh, today. I, did. Yep, yep. I think you already sent me the pictures though. Didn't you? If it's what I'm thinking, I, I think I think you know what the video is about. Yeah, I, I think I do. I'll still watch it though. Yeah. Don't worry. Yep. Um, well, everybody out there, thanks again for listening and watching. Hopefully, this helps you as you try to create a plan and think through buying vintage at the national. It's different, and just be aware of that. Shouldn't be. I don't. I'm not trying to make it sound intimidating or anything. Have a blast with it. Buy stuff you love, and. Uh, Andrew, again, thanks for making your debut on Golden Age of Cardboard. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. All right. You're welcome. All right, everybody out there, uh, see you at the National. Have a great one and keep calm.